All right, let's be honest. Windows Firewall is only good at blocking one thing, video games. Somebody's having fun, stop them. But today I wanna to test a different firewall that a lot of people have been talking about called Tiny Wall, which is free and everyone can install. And I wanna see if a firewall can really be effective at stopping info stealers from stealing our data and hacking our online accounts, sending our passwords to the dark web, all of that. So here we have three infamous info stealer samples. One of them is Redline. The other is another variant of Redline. And then we have a Luma stealer. I have confirmed that all three of these are working. They do connect to their domains when run in a test system. So now we're just going to see if the firewall is able to prevent that network communication from happening. Before that, I want to quickly show you the configuration. First of all, we should elevate this so it has uh, full system privileges. And I also want to show you the settings. So if we go into the manage section, they do have some settings for block lists. And this is to prevent specific malware. So it's got a port based block list, which means if a malware is using a certain port, it's going to block all communications via that port. And then it's also got a domain based malware and ad block list, which is just blocking connections to certain domains that are associated with adware and malware. Again, this is a free program, so anybody can go and download it. I'll make sure to include a link in the description below. It's also open source on GitHub, I believe. So it's relatively trustworthy in terms of the code. So first off, I'm going to execute this version of Redline and uh, we're going to run it. And as we expect, it opens terminal. It's going to begin trying to make connections via this. It's not going to show us anything, of course. And if we open task manager, we can see that we have terminal and inside of it, um, some other processes, but we don't see any real network communication coming from any of these. Now, if we take a look at the sample on virus total, this is the exact same file, we can see the same behavior. So it opens up a terminal window and then does nothing, just minimizes. But if we analyze the behavior, it makes a lot of HTTP requests. So this is what it should be doing. It should be reaching out to these IPs and most importantly, this particular address, 77.90.22. So I want you to kind of keep this in mind as we go forward. And now on the system, we're going to open up connections inside TinyWall and see what kind of traffic we have. So as you can see, we have a list of processes, but I don't see terminal terminal or the malware listed at all. And that's because we're only looking at active connections and open ports. But if we enable show blocked apps in the last five minutes, uncheck these to make things simpler, we can see redline1.exe making a connection to guess what? 77.90.22.45. This is the exact address that we saw in Vars total. And this is blocked. This was an outbound connection and it was blocked. So it prevented the initial outreach from the malware and therefore it wasn't able to establish the communication with the command and control server. And I guess our data is safe. But we're gonna do this again. So I'm gonna run it. And uh, this one gives you an error. You might have seen this in one of my earlier videos. It's like a fake Windows XP error window. But once again, if we look at our connections after running it, by the way, it is still running, even though it looks like it has terminated. If we go to details and do a search, you can see that redline2.exe is still running. But inside of connections, we can see that once again, our connections to the remote address were blocked. Now, interestingly, what happens when we run Luma Stealer is it actually executes, but it terminates pretty much instantaneously. It takes up a bunch of CPU at first, but as it's unable to establish the connections, it just goes away, it just disappears. It's no longer there. If we refresh this window, you can see Luma tried to make these connections and they were all blocked. And now the system is pretty much unaffected. Now, I don't want to make this just about one program. So we're going to try running the exact same thing, at least just Luma Stealer with a different firewall, just to show you that this isn't necessarily a universal result. All right, now we're on a system where I've just installed Glasswire. This is again, a free firewall, but the difference is this is not going to allow us to block anything by default in the free version. So it's perfect as a demonstration of what traffic we see on a system where we're not blocking anything. What would happen if you ran these info stealers without any blocking capabilities? So we'll 
we'll be able to see the connections that are made, observe them without interfering with them. So we're just going to copy over the info stealers again, and we'll open this folder. And we're going to start off with Luma Stealer first this time, because remember, this one didn't even run on the other system. It just terminated after a few seconds. Now let's see what happens here. As you can see, after some time, Luma.exe begins its first network activity, and it's connecting to this domain, which definitely <laughs> looks very sketchy and suspicious. And it's still running. It has not terminated. And of course, we can block it manually here if we want, and then it's probably going to terminate. So I'm going to turn it back on so we can keep it running. I want the info stealer to be nice and comfortable on our virtual machine. And you can see it's actually transmitting data. So this is an active info stealer that would hack you, and we were able to to prevent it from sending this data using TinyWall. Honestly, I was quite surprised by that because I didn't think it would be that effective. Let's see what happens with the red line samples. So again, it does execute and we have some network activity right away from redline1.exe connecting to this domain, which we saw from VarsTotal is the command and control server. So again, if you ran this on your system without the firewall, you would be hacked. My assumption when I wanted to make this video was that it would probably not be effective because a lot of the communications done by these programs would be via Windows services. And I do want to caveat the results by adding that little bit in because it is possible for malware to use host process for Windows, bits admin, via terminal to connect to malicious domains. And I'm not sure if the blocks by TinyWall were based on the malware domains, in which case it is signature based, which means if it's a new domain, it may not be caught or if they were just based on the ports or the nature of the communication. In any case, it was effective against at least three samples here. So based on that alone, it might be worth considering adding it to your system, especially because it's free. It's just a nice community tool. It also makes me think that firewall could be a more interesting component of system security going into the future because I think most hackers today are not interested in bricking your computer. They are more interested in collecting your information, hacking your social media accounts so they can use that or create an army of bots. And a firewall can prevent that kind of activity. So something to think about. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and share it if you did. And now to a sponsor. This video is sponsored by ThreatLocker, a zero trust endpoint protection platform. And we're going to see it in action. So so here we have it installed on a task system and we have a sample of Flink's ransomware. We're going to rename and execute it. But as you can see, it has been blocked successfully. And this is due to the fact that it is not trusted. Now we also have what they call a response center where we can review incidents and see what files have tried to execute. We can review information about them, run them in a test environment. And if they're recognized as threats based on their behavior, they'll show up in this section. Now we have done an independent test of Threat Locker. I highly recommend you check out that video using the link in description because that's not a sponsor segment. It's an in-depth evaluation, but I'm going to do another quick demonstration on the system and that is using VSS admin to delete our backups or shadow copies. This is a typical method used by ransomware and this is pure behavior. We're not running any real malware, no signatures involved. But as you can see when we try to run it, it is blocked by threat locker. So if we go into blocked items, it's going to show up as a prohibited behavior. Now this is because threat locker doesn't rely on signatures. It's just restricting access to specific types of behavior. Interestingly, this is one of the behaviors that it did allow in our test, but that was with the older policies. And now with the updated policies, it's no longer allowed. We also have the ability to configure your application control, allowing applications like PDF viewers to function, but not be able to be used to exploit and run code on your system. So it's a very interesting approach to endpoint security. I'd highly recommend you check out our full task video using the link in description or use the link in description to try them out. Show them some love for supporting the channel. This is Leo. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, stay informed, stay secure.